And uh, welcome to the terrible lecture on that terrible Muriel. That's right. Uh, she's terrible and she is Muriel. Um, uh, a film called Muriel's Wedding. It's, uh, it's not actually Muriel's Wedding at all. It's a false, it's a false title. And um, come on, give me an alternative title to Muriel's Wedding. That's what I want. Um, tagline, she's not just getting married, she's getting even. She's not really getting married. I mean, you know, the film isn't really about, uh, you know, the, the wedding of Muriel is what I want to say. Um, the, uh, it says here, a comedy about a small town girl who didn't fit in but is about to learn how to stand out. So it's uh, it's about being different, ladies and gentlemen. And if this course has taught you anything, it's um, it's that the Australian cinema is a cinema about outsiders and a cinema celebrating outsiders. And there is no greater outsider than uh, Muriel. Um, Tony Collette, and uh, Tony Collette, as I will get to very shortly, is um, a person, an actor, who has made a career in uh, playing outsiders. And she's done it very well. And um, the interesting thing about Tony Collette, when you think about it, is, uh, you know, she actually looks very, um, you know, she looks very normal. You know, she doesn't look like an outsider. Looks like she would be an insider in most uh, social and uh, professional situations. You would think, but um, you know, she she plays, she taps in to the outsiders uh, so well. She keeps getting work doing it. And um, what's interesting about uh, Tony Collette is often. The sorts of characters she plays should be kind of the second fiddle in films. And often they are the second fiddle in films. But she's also, you know, you know, she has opportunities. She's created opportunities for herself to um, to really take on uh, the lead. And she does the lead um, so very well. Okay, now uh, let's move on. I, I, I mean, I do, I mean, this lecture in a way is kind of, um, you know, a celebration of um, of the film, but it's also a celebration of uh, just Tony Collette, um, who's just uh, anyway. I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. okay. So the film uh, cleaned up, right? So the Actor Awards, which is called the AFI, um, when, the, when the film came out. So all right, what do we got here? So it won Best Film. Um, it was nominated for Best Direction and it was nominated for Best Screenplay by uh, P. P. J. Hogan. Didn't win. Uh, Tony Collette won. Well, that's a no-brainer. Um, and Rachel Griffiths won for Best Supporting Actress. Um, and it won for The Sound. So um, there's something about The Sound that's going on in this film. And... Uh, it won other things um, overseas, and Tony Collette um, won a number of awards, as did uh, Rachel Griffiths. It's kind of set up uh, Tony Collette's sort of international career. Now, this is interesting. So this is the USA response, and um, here are some some quotes. So this is Roger Ebert, and uh, Roger Ebert. We generally like what Roger Ebert. Um, what we don't like about Roger Ebert is that he doesn't like David Lynch. And, uh, you know, in Australian cinema, that's, you know, that's a real problem not to like David Lynch, the American director who has nothing to do with Australian cinema. Okay, Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times said the film is merciless in its por portrait. Of provision, provisional society, and yet has a huge affection for its misfit survivors. It has a lot of big and little laughs in it, but also a melancholy undercurrent which reveals itself toward the end of the film in a series of surprises 
and unexpected developments. The film's good heart keeps it from ever making fun of Muriel, although there are moments that must have been tempting. So he's a big fan of it. Now, the question uh, I'm, I'm asking you, do we laugh with Muriel or do we laugh at Muriel? And that is a very important question because if we're laughing at Muriel, the film doesn't work. Are you laughing at her or with her? Does the film humiliate her? That's the question. Now, uh, Peter Stack of the San Francisco Chronicle, he stated, With such recent hits as Strictly Ballroom and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, Australia seems to be cornering the market for odd but delightful comedies laced with substance and romance. The latest Muriel's Wedding is another bright, occasionally brilliant example. The movie is much meatier than its larky comic sheen leads you to think at first. There's poignant drama in this brash, sometimes overstated film, and Muriel's transformation is truly touching. What a nice review from uh, Peter Stack. Do you agree um, with uh, what's going on? Um, sometimes overstated film. Is the film overstated? Um, I suppose it's not understated. I suppose you, you couldn't make a claim that it's understated, but is it overstated? Um, and, you know... Uh, it is sort of a coming of age kind of story, isn't it? Of Muriel's kind of journey across the film from where she starts to where she ends. Uh, I would think. Now, Tony Collette. All right. So, um, if I haven't if I haven't said it yet, I'm a huge Tony Collette fan. I have great admiration for Tony Collette. And um, it's interesting, like when you think of a breakout performance. Right, you think of like Eric Banner. So Eric Banner makes Chopper, and then he goes to America and he makes Hulk with Ang Lee. Uh, he makes Munich with Steven Spielberg. You know, he's making massive films. He's a star of the massive films. It's like Eric Banner has broken out and broken away. But the thing about Tony Collette is because she's playing those really oddball, quirky characters, right? Um she's not necessarily going to have that sort of career where she's just suddenly the star of all these films. She's going to have smaller parts. And with uh, with Toni Collette, it's taken her a long time to build up her career. Right? Um, right. Now, so she does Mira's Wedding in 1994. Right? And then she pretty much stays in Australia, does Cosy, does A Lillian Story... Um, and then she does uh, The Boys, um, which is a great Australian film. And then she goes and does, uh, she works with Todd Haynes. Who's, oh, I love Todd Haynes, right? Um, if you haven't seen Carol, uh, where Todd Haynes is working with another Australian, Kate Blanchard, uh, um, a lesser Australian, can I say, than Tony Collette, um, are still an important Australian, a good Australian, but not as a great Australian as Tony Collette, and I'll get to my reasons in a second. Just hold on. Uh, but uh, Velvet Goldmine is a credible film. It's about uh, David Bowie without it being about David Bowie because you can have the rights. Anyway, um, she's really good in that. Then, 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 bona fide hugeness for Tony Collette. She does The Sixth Sense, where she plays um, the, the quiet and... Uh, not really uh, speaking mother. She's not mute. But uh, There's reasons. I don't want to give away the plot. She's really good in The Sixth Sense, and that film was a phenomenon as far as, uh, you know, actually being huge. And then she does Shaft, the, the remake of Shaft, which uh, I, I have seen. Um, and anyway, the point is, right, so she's sort of doing these kind of interesting films, changing lines. Oh, then about a boy. She's fantastic in about a boy. Oh, terrific. Again, a mother. Um, she often plays mothers, Tony Collette. And uh, oh, she's in the hours, was she? Okay, with uh, with our favourite, uh, Nicole Kidman. All right, now um, I'm just going to give you, this is a quote from Fincina Hopgood. And um, Fincina Hopgood's chapter uh, that you're reading for this week is a terrific chapter, and I'm not I'm not praising the chapter 
because it's in a book that I edited. I wouldn't do that, ladies and gentlemen. That would be um, that would be my ego talking if I was to do that, and I'm not doing that at all. I'm just telling you, it's a great piece of writing. Now, okay, this is what she says. Uh, Tony Collette offers a case study of a globally mobile Australian actor that illuminates the industrial and cultural exchange between the Australian and American film industries. Along with Russell Crowe, New Zealander, Hugh Jackman, Kate Blanchett, Naomi Watts, and Jackie Weaver, Colette is considered a member of the Gum Leaf Mafia, a term originally used to describe the industrial migration of Australian actors to Hollywood in the silent era. Colette's career path is typical of many Australian actors who have successfully found work in Hollywood while maintaining their connection with the local industry. Right. Um, so she's part of that gang, right? But even within that gang, she kind of feels like an outsider, which I will get to in a sec. But the fact is, as, you know, just this snapshot of her filmography, and I mean, this filmography that I'm showing is only from 1994 to 2002, and boy, she's gone on to do some wonderful things. United States of Tara, she just absolutely destroys. Fantastic. Um, but the thing about uh, Colette is she's she works in Australia. She goes and works outside of Australia. She comes back and works in Australia. She works outside of Australia. And she kind of keeps doing that. And she does it in a, a, a great uh, a great way. Now, I just want to um, uh, break, break things up uh, for a sec. Now, in Screen Australia, um, Screen Australia talk about how do we measure like a film like Mirror's Wedding? You know, how do we talk about uh, Mirror's Wedding? Now, they've done a report, which I'll, um, I'll, I'll give you a link to, ladies and gentlemen, um, called uh, Beyond the Box Office and What to Watch. And in that report, they address some of the challenges inherent in trying to measure engagement and ultimately success. Engagement. How do you measure engagement? How we're engaging with a film. These challenges occur even when tackling what should be the most tangible of outcomes, such as the number of times a film has been viewed, let alone its wider impact. So what they're trying to do is say, well, box office only, is only one way of looking, of measuring a film's success and engagement, right? Uh, in this report, we explore five indicators of success and long-term impact based on analysis of a selection of films from 15 and 20 years ago. Okay, now, this is how they do it, right? So, primarily release, the breadth of domestic and international release. Revenues, earnings across all platforms from all territories. Ongoing access, continued availability across platforms over time. Acclaim, festival screenings and awards one and wider impact new iterations and cultural awareness of the original form. So let's look at the chart that they came up with. And, um, right, okay. Standout performers are defined as those films released domestically in this period with an Australian gross box office of more than 2.5 million, not adjusted for inflation, and or a theatrical release in 10 or more countries. Right, so... Number of uh, countries, theatrical release. Mirror's Wedding, 40. Just killing it. Uh, the only films that got better releases, Shine, got 43, released in 43 countries. Um, Babe, 58, and Adventures of Priscilla, 36. And um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just looking for uh, Baz. Which doesn't seem to be, can't seem to find it. Anyway, okay, um, back to uh, Mirror's Wedding. So it was released in 40 countries. So that's good, right? Australian box office was 15.8 million. So that's that's a huge success. This is a extremely successful film, 15.8 million, right? Uh, mature English speaking markets box office. What's mature English speaking markets? Like, what's an immature English-speaking market? I probably shouldn't get into that now. It's, it's interesting. Uh, that would, uh, anyway, anyway. All right. So in mature English-speaking markets, as opposed to immature, um, it made $39.9 million. So it's really doing well. So think about that. Adventures of Priscilla, 
34.7. Now, um, Babe, well, that's 165.4 million. Whew. Wow. Big, big bucks. Shine, look at that. Look at that for mature English-speaking markets. Box office, 63.9. Um, there you go. Now, a uh, number of Australian video editions. What do we got here? Uh, Muriel's Wedding. 13. Wow. They're just cranking out the uh, the different versions of the DVD, aren't they? Um, the Adventures of Priscilla is is 18. Babe, 19. And uh, what's... Uh, what, well, Shine's only five. That's your problem. Get more DVDs happening with Shine. Um now, annual, um, uh, what do we got there? Uh, major festival screenings. Right, so this is the acclaim. The acclaim, ladies and gentlemen, that you're looking for. How many festivals it screened? Which is kind of, it's, it's a, that's a difficult thing to do because a film like Babe is not going to be fi- screening at festivals, right? Because Babe is like, we don't need the festival to get a good word of mouth. We've got something that's so brilliant here. We're just going straight into the cinemas. Hoyts, we got a film for you. Anyway, um, so the, you know they bypassed the uh, the major festival screenings. Now, um, uh, Mira's wedding, which is a bit of a sleeper, you know. Uh, they played in four, and uh, you know that's it. And uh, soundtrack release. Well, of course. <laughs> Of course, ladies and gentlemen, Muriel's Wedding had a soundtrack release. I mean, the greatest soundtrack of an Australian film perhaps ever, would say some students. I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not really an Abbott fan. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't, um, I don't have a problem with anybody liking Abba. And I think that the film used Abba in a wonderful way. Um, so, um, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave it there. But of course it had a soundtrack release and that, you know, that's a big tick. Now the spin-off and sequels, right? A uh, spin-off sequels, stage adaptations, um, or observed cultural impact. Now, Mira's Wedding has a very successful, uh, stage adaptation, musical stage adaptation. So for that reason... Uh, Muriel's Wedding is considered, you know, a standout performer for gross revenues, um, for, um, you know, acclaim, wider impact, and, um, you know, huge on uh, a, a television screen, has having played 10 times. And the only film that's played more on television is, you guessed it, The Castle. And um, the castle is uh, interesting, the castle. Um, I mean, I could look at this chart all day, couldn't I? I won't. I'll move on. But an interesting chart, um, interesting report. Just what do you think of that measuring, that that sort of way of measuring um, uh, Australian films, kind of impact and reach? And uh, do you think it's a good way of looking at it, looking at those different things, more than maybe just um, box office release and things like that? Uh, we can talk about that in the classes. Now, um, all right, uh, PJ Hogan, whose um, first name is Paul, but he's not, uh, you know, he's not the Paul Hogan. He's the other Paul Hogan. Um, all right, okay. Um, now, he was interviewed. This is the uh, one of the readings for the week. Uh, question, what about the feedback you are getting now? How do people react to the satire of Australian life? PJ, he says, Australians can take the most savage attacks on their national life and characters and yet somehow go on regardless and not change at all. No one's ever said you shouldn't have done that, but they do have some extreme reactions to particular characters. If the film gets to them at all, it's not because of the message. It's usually the mother character. She cuts very close to the bone for a lot of people. I think the mother-child relationship is a very powerful and volatile one. Okay. Um, Australian cinema. What's going on? What is going on with parents? I mean, if Australian films are telling us anything, it's that we have some serious problems with our parents. And uh, this is another film 
that um, uh, you know that, that does that. Now, um, what what is that actually saying about Australia and Australian society and Australians and the way we live and our national life and how is that being represented in a film like Muriel's Wedding? Um, here is another quote. Um, the PJ says. Yes, it is, because in Muriel's wedding, the mother is so forgotten. Betty is a woman that has receded into the background, and she recedes so far that she literally ceases to exist. She just becomes a photo. Like, literally, she becomes a photo. Uh, okay, well, what do we think about that with um, the mother being... I mean, when you think about it, a lot of films, absent mothers or um, mothers who don't really do much talking, uh, shine, right? Mother doesn't really say much. Well, she doesn't really say anything. I mean, I, I think she she has a couple of lines here and there, but you know, not. Chopper, the uh, mother doesn't exist. Um, now, Animal Kingdom's a, a different kind of film um, because the mother, in Jackie Weaver, <laughs> Jackie Weaver, she wasn't going quietly into the background. Jackie Weaver's like, give me the script, my friends. I will make this film about me being seriously in the faces of all my sons. And she does that. And uh, talk about breakout performances. Jackie Weaver in Animal Kingdom. Anyway. Um, what do we think about the mother, the way the mother's represented in the film, and also um, mothers more generally in Australian cinema? I think that's... Um, uh, worth um, discussing, you know. I don't like, I, you know, the film is certainly not misogynistic, or the film is certainly not unaware of the fact that it's kind of doing this to the mother. Like that is actually the, one of the points of the film. You know, these relationships that we, uh, that, you know, we have and things like that. But it's worth uh, bringing your attention to it and thinking about that um, when you're watching through the film. Okay, now back to Colette and uh, the reason why she's a greater um, uh, person than... Um, oh, no, I don't think it's... No, no, sorry, it's not this quote. I'm going to get to why she's a greater Australian than Kate Blanchett in a sec. Um, but I, I, I think this is something about um, Colette and also... Um, it seems if you want to get some um, credibility in the cinema, um, put on some weight because uh, Tony Collette put on a lot of weight for this role. And, um, you know, Eric Banner, a lot of weight for Chopper. You see the pattern here? So um, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Now, um, this is back to um, Fincina Hopgood's wonderful chapter, which does appear in a book that I co-edited. Um, did I already mention that? I don't even know if I mentioned that. Uh, uh, Catherine Tullich observes that as an actor, Khaled so often chooses to bury her attractiveness beneath, beneath her characters. Her characters are complex, both strong and emotionally vulnerable. Frequently, they are mothers living with a mental illness or caring for family members who are mentally unwell. Colette's physical transformation for these roles, which include gaining or losing weight, I just said that, didn't I? Cutting her hair or even shaving it off completely have become a hallmark of her acting style. In an industry obsessed with beauty, Colette has created a niche position for herself. I think I've somehow slipped through the net, basing my career and my talent and not on my looks. I'm not a vain person. If I like a script, I will make myself look as bad or as fantastic at as it requires. It's never about me. It's about the story. Well, if that doesn't tell you that Colette's a great Australian and just a great person, nothing will. And um, if I was a director, um, I would be casting Tony Collette. Um, for, for that sort of attitude that, you know, it's about giving to the, the project. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think this says so much about um, Colette. It talks here about this mental illness um, in Colette. And it's kind of, the film plays with 
it's not mental illness that the film plays with. It plays with unwellness. There's sickness going on in this film with the characters and how they're treated. Um, you know, how, like how the Bill Hunter character treats his wife. There is clearly mental abuse um, going on just through a withholding of affection, which can be a very cruel and debilitating thing to anyone. Um, there is the Rachel Griffiths character who, you know, is actually physically unwell um, at a particular point. And also just the kind of the abuse that um, uh, Muriel has to undergo across the film. Um, and that certainly taught, you know, we need to talk about that um, in the film, but also how Colette has always braced those sorts of um, performances and things like that. Okay, now here, this is why Tony Collette is a great Australian and a greater Australian than Kate Blanchett. Uh, what is an anti-star persona that Francina Hopgood talks about in her article? Right. Unlike her compatriots, Nicole Kidman, this is um, Hopgood's quote, unlike her compatriots, Nicole Kidman, Kate Blanchett, Naomi Watts, and Rose Byrne, Colette is not a spokesperson or ambassador for any clothing or cosmetic companies. Give her an award, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, back to the quote, this professional distance from the commerce of film stardom further con contributes to the construction of Colette's anti-star persona. A close examination of selected films from Colette's career illustrates how this anti-star persona has manifested on screen in both Australian and American productions. She's an anti-star, but more than that, she knows she makes enough money from her film. She doesn't have to be banging on about selling cosmetics and clothing and all of that. She's an actor, a proper actor, not a star, not a celebrity. She's an actor. And that's why we love Tony Collette more so than um, Kate Blanchett and Naomi Watts. And I'm, I'm at pain to say Nicole Kidman. Um, but, uh, you know, if I had to, if I had to, you know, choose between the two of them, well, you know, Colette, it's about, it's about the project she's working on. It's not about her. That's all I'm saying. And, uh, let me tell you this, if Tony Collette was in dead calm, right? Tony Collette would have been firing a flare into Billy Zane's mouth. Tony Collette would have done the firing of the flare. That's all I want to say. That's all I want to say. Think about that anti-star persona. What does that even mean? Uh, is this film... What is this film? Is it a comedy? Is it an anti-comedy? If we're talking about anti-things. Um, is this film a uniquely an Australian comedy? And uh, more quotes. Uh, While Muriel's Wedding may be remembered primarily for its abba Field soundtrack and deadpan comedy, such as the oft-quoted one-liner spoken by Muriel's sister, You're terrible, Muriel! Darker material is not far beneath the sun-kissed garnish surface of its Gold Coast setting. An emotionally abusive, adulterous marriage, a spinal tuner that paralyzes the um, fiercely independent Rhonda and the suicide of Muriel's depressed mother, Beryl, or con contribute to the film's unsettling blend of comedy and tragedy that would become a hallmark of Hogan's storytelling. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Right. So what Hopgood seems to be banging on about here is the film is like so uncomedy. It's got so many dark things going on in it. And you think this film is messed up, seriously messed up. How can it be funny at all? And it's like because it's so messed up and it's so dark and it's, the comedy is so dry, it's kind of hysterical for that reason. But... Um, you know, do you find that funny? Okay, now Jeff Mayer. Uh, so Jeff Mayer was a, a, a cinema academic. Uh, well, I suppose he's still a cinema scholar, still writing on cinema. But uh, you know, he's he's since departed academia for a uh, a life of um, lying beside his pool, thinking about great movies. He's retired. Is what I'm trying to say. Uh, now he he talks about. Um, Australian comedy and trying to define it. And he says, uh, you know, in regard to Colette, the strangeness, 
strangeness of her character's actions is intriguing and blackly amusing rather than alienating. So um, do you ever feel alienated from Muriel uh, and the way Colette's actually playing her? A characteristic of the local cinema are characters unable to get together. Then this film has that in spades where characters can't get together. It's so frustrating. Oz comedies often expose the dark and somewhat neglected side of the prevailing but ever-changing representation of Australia. Um, how does that quote sit with uh, the original? Final thought, what is an anti-star persona? How do you define Australian comedy as seen through this film? Do you watch Australian comedy? Would you pay to see an Australian comedy? How does the film operate within this course? And is how is it like other films in the course? Food for thought, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, all right, I'll leave it there. I mean, what more do I need to say? Tony Collette, brilliant. Mira's Wedding, fantastic. Great one-liners. ABBA songs. I mean, an Australian bona fide classic. A, you know, starring... The greatest Australian of them all, Tony Collette. And on that note, I'm going to leave you to it. And I look forward to laughing and crying with you all and listening to ABBA um, when we screen this film. So with that, bye for now.